Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Ingram Jones and thank you for tuning in to listen to another great interview. This time we have Stephen Meccano from the Knockout Show. Stephen, are you thank there? Thank you. I'm right here. Thank you for having us and me. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, for those people who don't know who you are, just give people a quick overview as to who you are. I'm the executive producer of a television show called Knockout. We're in our third season. We've had celebrities such as Roy Jones, Shane Mosley, John Scully, Floyd Mayweather Sr., Yoa Judah, Zab Judah, Nonito Donaire, Ruben Guerrero, and the list just goes on and on. Sean Porter, everybody's been on the show. You know, we got a great executive uh, director of competition that makes this happen named Rick Glazier, and uh, we got a great back office with Frankie and Glenn Rothenberg, and they make all these great stars put on this show. So what I do is that, and I got, on a side note, a baby product company, and it's called My Little Star. We do that out of New York, and we just have fun on TV and try to do the best we can in the boxing space. Wow, fantastic stuff. Um, thank you so much for reaching out to Bayloric TV. We are... Uh... We saw the stuff that you were doing, and we definitely wanted to get on board and find out what was going on. And, and you've got some great boxing names right there, and the stuff you're doing is fantastic. So we want to know a little bit more. Tell us a little bit about the knockout and or knockout on how it, how it started. How did it originate? Knockout originally was when we were um, putting together IMP, which is Iron Mike Productions. I was looking for additional revenue streams for IMP to be able to survive and do well in the boxing space outside of quote-unquote boxing because Showtime and HBO, they have basically their in-house promoters. Um, you know, if you're on Showtime, you're affiliated somehow with Heyman, you're on HBO, you're affiliated somehow with Aram or, or, or Top Rank. And I wanted to carve out a niche for IMP. I said, let's do a reality show. Everybody thought I was crazy. Uh, no one at IMP thought it was a good idea. I went to a network called Nuvo at the time, which was run by a gentleman named Bill Hillary. I got, I created Knockout. I got it greenlit. I brought it back to, um, once again, Mike and a guy named Gary at the time. And I was like, let's do it. They shot me down. I went to uh, Paradigm, one of the best talent agencies in L.A., and said, what do I do? I got a TV show with no stars. And... We put together a great team when we went and got the stars, and I ended up executive producing, creating, and writing the first season of Knockout, and that's how it came to fruition. How much of your inspiration came from the TV show The Contender, which was a very good show? A lot of people loved it. Sugar Ray Leonard, as people know, was involved with that, and you know we had some champions that come out of that, uh, Sergio Mora being one of those champions. Um, so tell us how that whether that inspired you all in that decision? You know, the contender really didn't ex inspire me at all. I know about the contender. I watched it. I'm a big fan of Sugar Ray Leonard and even a bigger fan of Sylvester Stallone. Right. So it's like, I like their show. I, was, I wasn't looking at it from that point. I was looking at it from a point of uh, positioning in the market space. Everything was taken. And... No one has dates unless you're Golden Boy, Top Rank, or, or, or Arrow. I mean, yeah, Top Rank, or, or Heyman, and, or Mayweather. And I didn't want to be under anyone's control. So when Knockout came about, even though we model some of our, um, some of our, uh, when we built the shop, we modeled some aspects in the same frames as the contender, we actually created Knockout as a distribution channel for up-and-coming fighters as to showcase our talent more so than uh, solely based as a reality-based show. Okay. What were the challenges that you faced um, with the idea of the Knockout? Because, you know, the idea is something that you, know, you have in your mind, you decide, well, I'm going to go and do this. There's always opposition. People always want to bandwagon afterwards when the success is there. So what was your challenges at first? 
Oh, we had an astronomical amount of challenges. Anybody in any space in Hollywood, whether you're a writer, an actor, a EP, a showrunner, uh, I take my hat off to anybody who makes it in Hollywood because you have multi-million people every year trying and, you know, less than 1% actually makes it. I got extremely um, lucky to have a relationship with a gentleman named Andrew Ruff. Okay. And he is one of the most powerful agents in Hollywood. And he guided, guided the growth of Knockout, and he steered me in the right direction. And to be honestly truthful, without Bill Hillary and Andrew Ruff, I don't think Knockout would be the success it is today if I was the only one leading the ship. So I have to... Um, State, I just had a great, great support and team of people around me. I got a, even a great daily supporting team. I got, you know, a guy named Glenn Rothenberg and a guy named Jerry Zarenda and a guy named Frankie O. And these guys, they just basically make sure on a daily basis that I'm really doing what I'm supposed to do. So I had a lot of challenges. I was just lucky enough to have great people around me that were just as smart or smarter than I was to help me through all of them. Okay, you know, this is the part where I want to know a little bit more about the team. Tell us a bit more about the backroom staff, those people that really made it happen for uh, Knockout TV. Well, the guy, Andrew Ruff, works for a company called Paradigm. Paradigm is the third biggest agency. They have Blackish, they package NCIS, uh, America's Next Top Model. Wow. Um, they, you know, they do um, movies like Insurgents, Divergence. They do, um, huh? They have the greatest music catalog of artists that you can meet from Aerosmith to Nine Inch Nails to Will I Am to Black Eyed Peas, et cetera, et cetera. So when I went to them with this concept and this idea and they were supportive of it, I knew I was on the right track. And as, as it grew, we were able to, to have a relationship with Foxwood, a guy named Felix Rappenport, who actually taught me how to um, play in the casino business. And then I woke up one morning and I was like, you know, this is huge now. Now we have distribution, 70 million homes. We have sponsors, advertisers, foreign countries. The WBC is coming on and partnering with us in, in several aspects. Then I said, wow, you know, it became overwhelming. And then I met a gentleman named Jerry Zarenda, really, really smart lawyer, you know, type guy. And he came and started doing a lot of the heavy, li heavy lifting I was lucky enough, a guy named Glenn Rothenberg came with him, who started doing a lot of heavy lifting, and then I had a core team of people, like my guy, New Forever, Frankie, and I got a couple of my guys that's been with me through diaper companies and concerts, who's a big-time matchmaker for Don King. Um, they all helped, and they all did their part. So, yeah, you know, that's the supporting cast, and... I may be on the on the forefront every day, but um, I take my cue from Vince McMahon. Like I'll be the show person, and um, I make sure I give the credit to the back office. Wow, it's always great to hear about the back office. Of course, yourself doing the great work and having the vision to to push through, even though that you were going to get opposition. What was your attitude towards the opposition when you were facing it? You know, I I, I don't think I can lose. I honestly don't think I know how to lose. It's, you can beat me up all day. It makes no difference. The end result is I know I'm going to be fine. It's like, you know, it, it, it's hard when people don't understand television. You know, you could be down. We were talking about this earlier. Like Vince McMahon at one point, WWE was bankrupt. No one believed when Dana White wanted $2 million. And now UFC, I heard, is up for sale for $3.5 billion. You know, there's always going to be naysayers and people who hate. They're going to hate what I do. They're going to hate what you do. They're going to tell us that we're not worthy. They're not going to invest. They're not going to do everything. You know, overnight successes are usually 10 to 20 years. So while people think that this is an overnight success, you know, for the people who don't or didn't want to deal with us, you know, I look at it as their loss because I know we're fine. And, and, and I wouldn't be on the phone with you on an international show if we weren't fine. We're fine. And I, I always knew we were going to be fine. Wow. Let's talk about uh, Iron Mike Productions or uh, promotions. Let's talk a little bit more about that. How did that come about? Uh, IMP, there was a, a good friend of mine who did the WWE. We were responsible for putting Mike Tyson in the ring with the WWE. 
uh, right after he been a man to hold in the field's ear, and we got the uh, biggest payday for Mike Tyson outside of boxing. The wow. guy's name is Craig Jones. Everybody calls the guy Craig Boogie. Okay. And um, he's been with Mike for like 25 years, and I knew Mike forever. And they came to me and they said, hey, Mike wants to get back into boxing. I knew a guy in Florida who had a boxing company, and, you know, the funny part, I can't even remember the the name. It was, uh, it began with an A. It was, um, it was something like that, Infinity or, or Aquinity. It was called Aquinity, Aquinity Sports. It was a guy named Gary Jonas and Henry Revolta. Right. And Henry Revolta is a great boxing guy, and um, they had some good fighters, and they wanted to get to the next level. So I said, well, why don't you guys partner and start IMP? And we aggressively went out and raised $1.2 million, like, within a week, wow. like, literally. And we put everybody together, and um, Mike and Gary were off to the races. And my job was to bring the ancillary income to support the, the, the venture until they were – financially secure based on the talent. And that's where Knockout and several other opportunities I bought to them came from. And when I bought it to them, they got starstruck. Like, everybody gets being around Mike. That's too small. That doesn't make sense. We need bigger money. And I was explaining to people, you got to remember, Mike hasn't been an active boxer for over a decade and a half, 15 years. Mike really hasn't been in the ring. So I don't know where you feel that Mike has outside of being a legend and having the best, one of the best names in boxing, currently all the people that have the stranglehold on the business currently, why would they allow Mike Tyson back in so easily? And I said, we need ancillaries. And everybody thought Mike being Mike, that he would walk in and, you know, be able to, um, be able to, to get the people at HBO and Showtime or ESPN to say, hey, here's 20 dates. And um, after they didn't do the deal with me, and at that point we had a disagreement, me and the guy uh, Gary, and we decided to part ways. Um, all I can say is two years later there's no more IMP, or three years later there's no more IMP. So I guess there's still a knockout, so I guess my vision was correct and theirs was incorrect. Wow. That's sad to hear, but, you know, Mike is doing his thing, is he not? I love Mike. Mike is doing all types of stand-up, and Mike is doing all types of movies. Mike has a cartoon. Yes. Mike is great. We're actually trying to uh, work with Mike's brother-in-law, Hazim, on packaging a movie for Mike. Mike Tyson is charismatic, great, talented, and I'm not saying that IMP is not there because of Mike. Mike could have made it happen. But well, Mike's job is like my job. Mike is to be the front person and depend solely on your back office. Without my back office doing what they're supposed to do daily, I'll fail. That's not our job. That's not Mike's job to dot the I's and cross the T's. That's not my job to dot the I's and cross the T's. My job is to be creative, come up with concepts, make marketing strategies, and depend on Glenn and Jerry and Frankie and depend on Andrew Ruff and Bill Hillary to make sure I'm doing what the hell I'm supposed to do. And they depend too much on... Mike's business acumen to, 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 to be successful, and they were wrong. They, they misjudged the situation. That wasn't his job. His job was to be charismatic and show up to the events and, you know, be a politician, hug and kiss babies and let everybody know he's there and really let everybody know it's his company. Absolutely. And from the fighting aspect, no, he's picking the fighters and doing the day-to-day. -day. And if Mike would do that tomorrow with INP and have the right back office, he would be gigantic. It would, it would, you know, Golden Boy, where people don't realize when they say De La Hoya is so big, De La Hoya raised $100 million. When people say Heyman is so big, Heyman raised $300 million. When they say, you know, Bob Arum's big, yeah, Bob Arum's big. It's been consistent, but it's a 50-year business. When you say even people, you know, who's not in the game no more, you know, Don King and all of them, these are all big names, but they had a lot of financial support behind them. And, you know, when people don't want to spend the money to be successful, the end result is usually you're not successful. I tell my, my, my guys, like going back to my back office, yeah. we have disagreements sometimes. I tell them, we can't play in a $100 million game if we're not willing to put up a few million. 
We can't play in a billion dollar game if we can't come up with 50 to 100 million. We can't play in a multi billion dollar game coming off of, you know, trying to say we're going to do it on 500,000. It's impossible. Yeah. It's just totally impossible. The, the powers that be will shut us down on a regular daily basis. So, like I said, Mike is doing his thing, and what they did, they put too much pressure on his celebrity and his name to carry the brand without being supportive financially and doing what was right. Now, if they would have gave Mike a fighting chance and said, we got $25 million to start this company, there's no doubt in my mind right now they would definitely be one of the top five promoters in the world. Wow. Wow. While you're on that point, I know Mike did an interview a couple of years back. I think he was talking about 50 Cent coming into boxing. And he said, it's not as if you just can't, I know you're very good at what you're doing music, but when you come into an entertainment, when you come into boxing, it's a different realm. And he had, I believe he had Gamboa, and uh, I think he had Billy... Um, Billy Dibbs. Yeah, he had him as well. Um, but it, promotionally, it didn't quite go well for Gamboa or, or Billy. Um, what, what was Mike kind of alluding to when he was saying that? Well, I can't speak for Mike because I don't actually know, but what I could speak about is what I feel personally, and I feel personally that 50 Cent is an extremely intelligent businessman, but I also feel that boxing is to a point, that's why we created our own lane, uh, a self-contained business, and they really don't want anyone new coming into the game, and I think that... um, 50 Cent was on the right track. And I think 50 was extremely smart when he was going to do the deal with um, Floyd. Because Floyd is, you know, like God in boxing. And I think that do the deal that uh, 50 continued. He didn't realize the same thing that um, a lot of people didn't realize. You're rolling the dice. You know, you have $2 million invested into a guy and he gets stretched. You know, you may not, you may never get your two million dollars back. So, I mean, it was a smart gamble. All I can say about uh, SMS is, I'm sure as smart as that guy is, if anyone can come in the sport and make it, he's one of the guys who can. And um, but it's going to take time to see any needs the right fighter. Gambo was good. Gambo just fought somebody off a knockout. He fought um, Highland Williams. You know, it went it, it went the distance, and he won. But um, you know, you need you need the overall everything. You need the star power. You need the name. You know, you need the uh, you, you you need that it factor. You know, you need to be. There's not that many Canelos out here. There's not that many Mayweathers. There's not that many. You know, even though he lost a couple of fights, there's not that many Broners. There's not that many people that people just attach themselves to. You know, you had the Sugar Ray Leonard's and the, the, the Chavises, and, you know, look at the heavyweight division after Mike Tyson. Who connected with the with the audience? You have to connect with the audience, just like if you're a musician or an actor. There's nobody connecting truly with the audience. So 50, if you can find a guy to connect with the audience, he's a smart guy. He'll be fine. So how does it work with Jay-Z, then? Another one who's in boxing, Andre Ward, they're signed. Um, how does that work out, then? I mean, he just signed Cotto. Cotto's a big name, but Cotto, we know, is on, you know, the last part of his career. Yep. And um, hopefully, like I said, when you got that much star power and that much ability to raise money and you're as smart as they are and you're recognized and you have Twitter followers to, you know, millions and millions of people, you know, a lot of times people feel that's enough. And a lot of times it is enough to start doing the business aspect of it, raising the money, staffing, um, basically getting all that stuff done. But if you don't have that superstar maker, if you don't have that right matchmaker or you don't have that guy who's going to go out there and promote himself and really, like, push the envelope, like, let's look at Shannon Brave. He hasn't really been in the heavyweight mix for quite some time, but he's here now. He's about to fight David Hay, but every day with the let's go champ, let's go champ with the podcast every day, you know, utilizing his own money. And, you know, I don't know his financial situation, but utilizing his own money to run around the world and chase Crisco and do all that. He worked super hard just to find himself back in the mix. And now he's back in the mix. So he connected with the people with his Let's Go Champ campaign. And um, if he can win now, if he beats Hay, guess what? He's, he's in line for an extremely big payday. And um, 
he'll be able to sell out a couple of more arenas a couple more times based on his age. It won't be forever, but, you know, he has a chance to connect and make some real money. Absolutely. Coming back to the knockout, because this is what the interview is really about, and I really appreciate the insight you've given us so far. In terms of distribution and in terms of being able to see the show previously, how would I get to see that like, we're based in Europe? How do we get to know more about this, the knockout show? Um, we're going to do a digital deal soon for season one, two, and three. I can't, you know, basically divulge where it's at because right. I'm not the agent and okay. um, I'm not the network. But I know that um, I know a lot of people because we're getting a lot of requests worldwide for knockout now. Yeah. Um, we're trying to do foreign deals with companies from Mexico. We're trying to do European deals. Things like certain other people. Okay. And um, if we don't get those done, which they're not done, you know, it's a 50-50 chance they'll ever get done, we're going to be on a really big digital platform that everybody will be able to see us worldwide anyway. So we're in a good spot. So you'll definitely be able to see season one, two, and three of Knockout. And um, for the people who haven't seen it, when they do see it, they'll see the improvement yearly. Like year one, on a scale of one to ten, we were a real solid six and a half. Okay. On year two, we um, were a super solid eight. On this year, um, from what Frankie was telling me, I think we're going to be like a 20. So, wow. you know, we're, 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 we're really um, growing and we're about to shock a lot of people. And, you know, we got, we're, we're starting to get a lot of interviews and a lot of people like yourself yes. interested. And I, I, I wasn't the person, I didn't want to do interviews before, but, you know, I look at the marketing prowess of, um, Dana White and Vince McMahon. Um, I realize if you get out there and you support what you're doing, people at least have the choice to say I hate it or I love it. I wasn't being fair to the consumer. I wasn't giving them the chance to say they hate it or they love it. And luckily for us, we got a lot more love than hate, so we're in a really good position. I go back to the contender because that was a very big show in the UK and the US, and it sold well and. People loved it, tuning in week by week to watch the show. How does the knockout differ to the contender? And what do people expect to see when they tune into the I knockout? Think, I think knockout is a little, you know what, I don't want to use the word better because the contender in their, in, in their space was great. So, And I don't want to be disrespectful to the contender in any way. Right. So I, I'll use the word different. Right. The way we're different is... We're changing the game. We're coming in young and fun, hip and hard. We're coming in basically to um, move the needle with the younger demographic. You know, the contender was basic boxing. You go in there, great competitions. Three, you know, you're doing your three rounds. You know, people were really fighting hard. But you know what they missed in the contender? The fun to it and the crossover appeal. Boxing has about 3 million hardcore fans. UFC has, you know, multi-million hardcore fans. And the one who has the most out of all of them is the WWE. Millions upon millions worldwide fans because the WWE is an entertainment factor. Now, the WWE is not a real league or a real sport. So with that being said, you can only mirror some of it, but... You have to keep it real for the hardcore fans. So all our fights are real. All our fights, they go hard. Everybody, we follow the WBC rules. But what we are starting to do is look at the entertainment value, the pyrotechnics, the storylines leading up to the fights and the reality shows. We look to build a star, you know, um, bigger than uh, the actual boxer. Now, if you ask yourself a question, let's take – Two really great boxers. Let's say, um, I don't want to put anybody's name because the comparison is not fair, but let's say you got a boxer, a champ at 118, 130, 135, 147, 140, you know, 154, 160. A lot of people can't name who's the champ at, in the divisions unless you've been a Showtime or an HBO fighter. So a lot of people can't name the champ. So Let's do, let's do, let's do, let's do uh, uh, a comparison. You got a good, rated, solid fighter. He's fighting, name two venues wherever you're at that's across the street from each other. 
Oh, I don't know. Um, hmm. Or at Venue A. You got the great fighters at Venue A. Across the street at Venue B, I have a celebrity boxing match, and I have Kim Kardashian fighting Paris Hilton, and I have Kanye West fighting boxing and celebrity for charity, Jay-Z, and I have Aerosmith fighting the guy from Nine Inch Nails or, you know, the guy from Nine Inch Nails fighting the guy from Imagine Dragons or whatever, and I got Tiesto and Skrillex doing the music for the night. Wow. The guy who's the real incredible boxer who works and runs and trains and he's the champ that you don't recognize won't sell nearly as good as that celebrity who's down across the street. Because no one knows him. Okay. So my job is to make the knockout fighters recognizable outside of boxing same thing they did with Victor Ortiz with the Expendables. Yes. Same thing they did with Ronda Rousey with Fast and Furious and uh, um, Entourage. But I have to hope when I do make them popular or famous outside of the ring, Crossover they, have that Floyd May, they have that Floyd Mayweather work ethic, and they're able to work hard enough to transcend that back into the ring. See, the thing is, uh, one of the things that I've noticed, and one of my criticisms of PBC, uh, is, is that a lot of their fighters, I don't know any of their fighters have got crossover appeal. Yeah, they may be good boxers, they may be world champions, but they've got no crossover appeal. You don't see them anywhere else. You just see them on PBC. There's no crossover personality. That's why even as Amir Khan loses, Amir Khan's still a star. He has crossover appeal. You know, Timothy Bradley, great, solid, strong fighter. Love him. He just goes a little tank. Yeah. But not that major crossover appeal. There you go. So that's why, that's why Canelo can relinquish the belt and still go his next fight and not concern about his payday because he's a crossover superstar. There you go. And that's what we, that's what we want. We want superstars. And we got superstars. Then, um, then, 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 then we're doing our job. So we talk. You're talking as well about um, celebrity boxing. Um, I do know somebody who did, who's done some celebrity boxing. Um, David Felt, uh, um, Damon Feltman, and uh, did an interview with him before, and he was trying to get certain celebrities to fight one another. The one that I remember was um, the guy from Different Strokes and Vanilla Ice. That was a grudge match. It was built up over a period of time, and uh, that worked out quite well. How are you gonna? How would you use celebrities to cross over into boxing and it still be taken seriously? I, w- I, I don't want celebrity boxers. Boxers are boxers. I use celebrities in in who love the sport to promote the sport, not to actually box. I mean, actually think yourself. You know, the different strokes guy, Vanilla Ice. That 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 that's after their career was at an all time high. You know. I would be foolish to think I can go get somebody who's, you know, Jay-Z makes $700,000 a night. Hey, Jay, go box. For what? Like, what's the reason? It's like, what, are you gonna, what, are you, what, what can you give me except, you know, a black eye or, or, I, or I knock somebody out? Even if he wins, there's no upside. And, that, you know, Jay and those guys, they train a lot. They're at Chelsea Gym. They fight. They can fight. It's not these guys. So many celebrities love boxing, and, and they actually box. But why? What, what would be the purpose of even wanting to have them box for, you know, for, 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 for the fans? The fans aren't going to really, the true boxing fans aren't going to engage into it. For the sport, no, you're not really promoting the sport. You're actually, you know, uh, 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 make making someone make, make a mockery of the sport. Yeah. So it doesn't work for that. Now, if you're saying Susan B. Coleman for breast cancer, in October, is throwing a pink gloves event, and celebrities want to come out, and they want to put headgear on, and they want to put on 20-ounce gloves, and they want to go in the ring and jump around and play and not really try to hurt each other more of an expedition situation and not be on TV. You know, or if it is on TV, it's just solely based on putting the money towards the Susan B. Coleman Foundation or 
the WBC has a foundation where they're doing all these great things for children. Absolutely. And they're doing all these things, you know, and all, all if you want to do it for that, I'm a hundred and fifty percent supportive. You know, you know, I'm getting a little older, but I'll jump in the ring and and, and do my best. Win or lose, I won that night because I'm helping other people and I'm not making a mockery of the sport. Right. But at the same time, do I think that celebrities and hardcore boxers, you know, live in the same space? No, I don't. And and I think that I don't want to make a mockery of the sport and I don't want to promote that for any amount of money. And I saw something the other day. It was in WWE. You had um, the actor Arrow. Um, Stephen Amell jumping in the ring and it was in Canada actually I think the fight was happened and he fought against one of the uh, big big super WWE superstars um, and that kind of pulled off pretty well and it was a very big viewed event so how was that able to be pulled off so well? It's scripted you know the outcome they train with each other it's, it's, it, 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 it's acrobatics, it's scripted, it, 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 it's, it's stuntmen, it's choreographed, it's, it's, it's great. It's, I love it. I love when I see, you know, Shaquille O'Neal in the ring or if I see uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather in the ring. You know, Floyd is the best fighter in the world. Yeah. Can Floyd really, you know, knock out a guy who's 540 pounds? Possibly if he catches the guy right on the chin, but if the guy fell on Floyd... What's going to happen? I mean, the guy's six seven, five hundred and forty pounds. You know, Floyd is five eight, one one sixty. Does that make him not the best athlete in the world? Which Floyd Mayweather is, if he would actually really have a true confrontation with that guy, a no, you know, whole fight. I mean, it's just size. That's why his weight class is. I don't want to, you know, you know. WWE is great, and they're a show, and I love them, and I think Vince McMahon is a genius, but like I said, it's choreographed. It's not, it's not real. No one's going to get hurt. You know, the boxing community, the UFC community, would never put somebody who's 500 pounds in what a guy wants it. Okay. So, well, here, here's you know. something then. Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor, you must have heard it over and over and over again. What's your take on it? If Conor McGregor gets in a ring with Floyd Mayweather and tries to fight a stand-up fight game, um, Conor McGregor is going to go to sleep and be in the hospital for about two months. If it's a UFC fight, um, I would avoid, I, 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 would, I would say that Conor would choke Floyd out. But Floyd would be a fool to get in the ring and get kicked in the legs and get elbowed in the face and, and, and get choked out um, um, in that in, in, in that sport because that's not what he does. Okay. But there's no body in the world between 140 and 160 that's going to stand up with Floyd Mayweather and fight it out, and Floyd is not going to come out the victor. If you give Floyd maybe two or three more years, maybe he's 41, 42, maybe he gets a little older, maybe he slows down a bit, then, I'll, then, then maybe I'll change my opinion. But right now... Nobody's fighting Floyd Mayweather way. Well, what about an exhibition bout for his 50th fight? Because that's the way I kind of see it happening. Because there's too much money on the table to take off that Floyd and Conor won't fight. But a boxing fight, a boxing match, exhibition boxing match. I mean, but then it's not a real fight. Then, he, then it's not his 50th. Then it's not his 50th bout. Then it, 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 it's not governed by the WBA, WBC, the Athletic Commission. It's, what you said is expeditious. But he has no Do belts. He has no belt, so he's given all his belts up. I mean, I mean okay, so you give up all the belts. Now you now you have it as a. Then what rules apply? Is it a boxing match or is it or is it a ex, you know is it a UFC match? I mean, there's a lot of things that you have to figure out. Do I agree with you that it would be great for both sports? I agree with you 100. percent the, the the viewership would be astronomical. The, 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 the pay-per-view would sell, you know, I believe better than Pacquiao and Mayweather. I agree with but that. At the same time, but at the same time, you have to figure out the rules and regulations, so you're going to need some governing body to figure out the rules and regulations. If there's going to be, you know, three knockdown rules in effect, if you're going to be able to, you know, 
Uh, 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 is it, what's the ounces of the gloves? Are you going to be able to hold? Are they eight ounce gloves or the UFC gloves? There's a lot of you know. There's a lot of uh, a lot of things that go in a lot of events because you have to be concerned with the safety of the human being and the safety of the fighter. So, I mean, what it sell definitely it, it, it'd be gigantic. How, how from a technical standpoint can they pull it off? Definitely. Do I have any idea how they would do it? While I'm sitting here talking to you, I have no idea. Wow, wow. So, okay, to close and to talk more about the knockout, what will people? What do people? What can people expect? from the third series, which you've got now? The best boxing, quote-unquote, reality show slash entertainment slash boxing and fight and business education they're ever going to get. It's going to be... You know, we're looking behind the scenes of, uh, of what it takes to put on an event. The executives are in the show. The boxers are in the show. Agents are in the show. They're going to see, um, what I would say is they're going to see um, Contender meets UFC meets Entourage. It's going to be one hell of a ride this season. Wow. I wish I could be there to see some of it and be a part of that because it sounds amazing. Well, come on, fly in and let's do a live interview on the show and... You know, let's let, let let let's put thirty seconds on the show and be a part of it. I mean, knockout's different than your average television show because if you're involved with the sport in any kind of way, from a cut man to a matchmaker to you know the person in the back office that that that, that cuts the checks, or the person that deals with the athletic commission, or even the person that goes, you know, does the hand wraps. Everybody has to be recognized for their expertise, and everybody has to be recognized because I want people to really know it's a lot of people. It takes a lot of people to make a champion, and it takes more people to make a superstar. Wow. And the reason I say that is the reason I say that a champion can be made with your trainer, your corner man, your cut man, your advisor, and your manager. That could be a champion. Now let's make a move. Now let's make a movie star. You need all of those things right there if you're a boxer, plus your agent, makeup artist. You need your PR person. You need your uh, your, your acting coach. You need your, your stylist. You need everything else that goes into making a superstar. See, what happened with Ronda Rousey, in my opinion, is not that she's not a great fighter. And she became a superstar and forgot the reason I'm a superstar it's is because be I was a great fighter first. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. One final question I must ask. In the three, in the three series, oh, this is the third series, the last two series that you did, who was the, out of all the fighters that you worked with, who was the best fighter you worked with or the best experience you had working with? The best fighter, they're all good. The breakthrough guy who I thought was going to be incredible and he just lost was Keith Tapia. The most exciting person um, from a um, from a television standpoint was um, Tim Coleman. Okay. So Tim yeah. Coleman is the most exciting fighter for reality television that I've ever seen in my life. Right. One of the most talented people I've ever had the experience of knowing just from a boxing. I'm not. I'm not looking at records or anything. I'm just looking at a, 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 an experience of talent. Um, Probably the most talented person to be on the set of Knockout, probably Zab Judah. Wow. Um, the most charismatic, um, charismatic person on the set. Yep. Um, most charismatic person, I'm looking back, would probably be Ruben Guerrero. Ruben was really yes. like that guy. I love Ruben. I think I he's great. So do I. And, um... And to be overall for a gigantic star, the nicest person in knockout history is Roy Jones Jr. Wow, 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 RJJ, wow. Yeah, he 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 was the he has been such a major asset to season two. He was extremely supportive, and I love Roy Jones Jr. I think he's great. I think he's a super talent. But just to recap the question, um. 
up-and-coming talent. I thought it was going to be Keith Tapia, a uh, reality guy all day is um, Tim Coleman, natural ability and talent and just athletic, blessed from God, Zab Judah, pound for pound, great, all the ability in the world, can fight his ass off, but the nicest guy in the world, Roy Jones Jr. Wow. Stephen Marcano, thank you so much for talking to Bayloric TV, and we look forward to following the journey of Knockout. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much for recognizing Knockout. And um, please, you know, tell everybody to tune in. If they can't find Knockout, um, complain. Call whoever is your local cable provider or your digital provider. Complain. Tell them you want Knockout. Uh, They'll figure it out. We'll, but, but we will be on a digital platform um, this year. Last year, I know we were on Hulu. Um, but I, I don't know if it's Hulu or a different digital platform. But I know we will be on a digital platform so the world can see it this year. To get your Netflix would be amazing. I love Netflix. I think Netflix is incredible. Um, I hope Netflix gets into live sports. I think Netflix... Look, I'm going to give you just from being a fan and I mean this from the bottom of my heart HBO Showtime and every other carrier better I hope Netflix doesn't get into live boxing it'll be a major problem worldwide for the major networks wow wow so tell the guys you know I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure that Netflix has smart people and they know the ability but if um we were over at Netflix um, for our digital platform because we love Fuse for our linear platform. If we were there for our digital platform, it would be incredible, you know. And hopefully the back office and the agents and the um, other executives that knock out will figure out the right digital platform for us. Fantastic. Stephen, thank you so much for talking to Bayloric TV. Thank you so much. Hope to hear from you soon. Bye-bye. All the best.